Genesis chapter 22. We'll pick it up at verse 1. It says, After these things God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Here am I. Here I am. And he said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So we'll pause there for a minute. So it says, after these things, after the things we've been talking about in these chapters preceding chapter 22, Isaac had been born to Abraham now, the child of promise. And now we enter into this extraordinary test for Abraham. kind of defies our logic. Even those of us who've read it over and over again, it, it's just an amazing thing to read what God has asked Abraham to do now. And this test was not so much of a test to produce faith. Abraham had been through a number of those. It was a test really to reveal faith. God built Abraham slowly, piece by piece, year by year, into a man of faith. And Abraham had had lots of tests up until this point, hadn't he? As he had been on this journey. God had asked him to leave his family in Ur of Chaldees and make this long journey into the promise, what would become the promised land. Leave everyone behind. And Abraham did that. He did well with that. He did what the Lord had asked him to do. And then when he had got there, there was a famine in the land. And Abraham didn't hang out there and trust in the Lord. He took off down to Egypt and came into 10 miles of bad road. Said some things that weren't quite true about his wife and that didn't go well. And so that, that whole situation really was a learning moment for Abraham. And then God had promised him a son. And how did he do with that test? He and Sarah, they waited and waited, and finally their patience didn't win out. And they didn't trust quite enough. And so they took matters into their own hands, and, and that ended up not working out so well either. And then later on, as we just read recently, he did an obedience test with Abraham. He, as there was some drama in the household with Hagar and Ishmael, Abraham's wife Sarah has just had enough with it. And she said, they've got to go. And God said, yes, they do. And so Abraham was obedient in this particular test and sends Ishmael out with his mother, Hagar. We need in our lives to distinguish between trials and temptations. They're two completely distinct things. Temptations come from the desires that are already within us. Temptations come from desires that are already at work within us. While trials come from the Lord, who has a special purpose to fulfill. Temptations are used by Satan to bring out the worst in us, but trials are used by the Holy Spirit to bring out the best in us. Temptations seem logical, don't they? Temptations seem logical while trials seem very unreasonable. It's interesting. And God's testings are tailor-made for each child of God. Each of us have different testings, depending on where we are in our walk and where God wants us to go. And each experience is unique. God never asked Lot to face the test that Abraham was facing, did he? Because Lot was being tempted by the world and the flesh and, and really never grew to a place of maturity where Abraham had reached. And in one sense, it's really a compliment when God sends us a test. It shows that God wants to grow and mature us in the school of faith. God never sends a test until he knows you are ready for it. So what do we make of this particular test? It seems crazy, doesn't it? God made Sarah and Abraham wait all these years, decades, 
for this child of promise. And finally he arrives. And then he takes care of this whole situation, this conflict with Hagar, who is still in the household, and Ishmael. He provides for them. And now Abraham, he tells them, I want you to take this child who I've promised to you. And I want you to go to Moriah and let's offer him up as a burnt offering on a mountain. What do you say? The trial boggles the mind and it doesn't make sense on the face of it, does it? When viewed from a physical perspective, this whole plan is nonsense. But from a spiritual perspective, this trial that God asked Abraham and his family to endure is an amazing, amazingly beautiful foreshadowing of what God would endure when he sent his only son to die on that very same mountain. So let's look for the parallels as we go through this chapter. In verse 3 it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So how long did... Abraham negotiate with the Lord about this? How long did he rationalize his circumstances and, and the calling that God had put upon him? Now it says he rose early the next morning, immediately. Abraham had received direction from the Lord, and he had learned the hard way, hadn't he, that he needed to obey it. And God was going to take care of it all. He had to put his faith in God, that this was all going to work out somehow, even as crazy as it sounds. So Abraham saddles his donkey that next morning, and he brings along with him two men and his son Isaac. And the language here indicates that Abraham personally cut the wood for the burnt offering. And I can imagine that. Though he trusted God, I, I really wonder how much sleep he got that night before. And they're embarking on their journey. And how much nervous energy was inside of him because of what God had asked him to do. And if you've ever done it, splitting wood is a great way to relieve stress. And I bet you that wood was in tiny little pieces. And something important to note here is that from the perspective of the narrative, Isaac was as good as dead at this particular point. Isaac was as good as dead. God had given the word, and Isaac was now a dead man walking. Verse 4, it says, on the third day, they're on their journey. They went on their journey, and then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar, the mountain to which God had directed him. Which day was it? Third day. So three days after God had given the word and Isaac was, in effect, dead, they came to the place where God had designated that this offering take place. In verse 5 it says, And then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So at this point, Abraham leaves these two young men that were helping them on their journey behind with the donkey and the, and the gear that they had brought with them. He tells them they're going to go away to worship, he and Isaac, and that they would return. Interesting. He didn't say, I would return. He says, we will return. And when he says, we will go over there and worship, this is the first use of the word worship in the Bible in reference to God. First time we see this word, the Hebrew word is shaka, and it simply means to bow down. And I think there's something significant in this word that I think we can learn from, whether individually or when we come together to worship, we are coming before the God of the universe in response to who he is and what he has done as creator 
and God and Savior. It's not uncommon for us around here to ask, well, who's, who's doing worship this week? And our response should be, I'm doing worship this week. The people up here on the stage just provide the music by which we can all enter in to his presence. To bow down, as it were, and worship him. The quality and the quantity and the passion behind our worship should be an overwhelming response to the amazing God that we serve. Revelation 4, verses 8 and 11, we read as we went through Revelation, <clears throat> not so long ago, and it says, the four living creatures, each of them with six wings. He's speaking of the cherubim here, remember. These cherubim are full of eyes all around and within, and day and night they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne, and they worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns down before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. That's worship. Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, verse 28 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with what? Reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. In Psalm 100, verses 1 to 5, it says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, and his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. When we read the 24 elders around the throne worship, what do they do? They fall down before him. That's that Hebrew word, shakah. The author of Hebrews talks about worshiping with reverence and with awe because our God is a consuming fire. And in Psalm 100, we're told to make a joyful noise. Entering his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. People that are out there in the street should know that we are worshiping God in this place. Warren Wearsby writes, Worship is the believer's response of all that they are. Mind, emotions, will, and body to what God is and says and does. I love that. Worship is the believer's response of all that they are. Emo mind, emotions, will, and body to what God is, what God says, and what God does. So we continue in verse 6. It says, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. And what does he do? He lays it on his son Isaac. Interesting. He lays it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. And so they went, both of them together. So what does he lay on Isaac before they head up to the mountain to worship, to sacrifice? He lays the wood. Another parallel here, this time to Christ carrying his cross to his sacrifice on this very same mountain 2,000 years or so later. Jesus Christ carried 
his burden of sacrifice to the same place. The place where Abraham and Isaac are heading is the very same place where Jesus' crucifixion took place. And Isaac said to his father, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. So at this point, Isaac asks Abraham the big question, the, the, the elephant that's in the room. Where's the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? Got the fire, we've got the wood. We're, something's missing here. He's doing the math and it's not adding up. And how does Abraham respond? It's prophetic. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Abraham knew that God would provide a sacrifice, but where? Where was the lamb? And that very question has been asked by the faithful from Isaac to Moses to David to Isaiah all the way to the time of John the Baptist when he declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And it says that they both went together. This literally means the two of them went in agreement. Isaac did this knowingly and willingly. The phrase is repeated actually twice in this passage for emphasis. Verse 9, it says, And when they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. What a moment. Think about it. Put yourself in Abraham's place. Put yourself in Isaac's place. Think about what's going through Abraham's mind at this moment. And think about what's going through Isaac's mind as he's lying there on this heap of wood. This was a true test of faith for both of them, wasn't it? Abraham had been assured by God that it would be through Isaac, this boy who's lying on top of this pile of wood, it would be through him that his offspring would be named. Abraham was holding on to that. Finally. And now God was asking him to do this. And so he moves forward in absolute obedience and absolute faith despite the current circumstances. And the circumstances were rough. We have to give it to him. And how much this completely defies logic and common sense. It just totally defies logic and common sense. Abraham and Sarah had longed for this boy for years and years and years. And God had finally given them the gift. But we have to be careful that our heart doesn't belong to the gift, but it belongs to the giver. So the gift itself cannot become an idol to us. I think a lot of this test was for Abraham to be willing to lay that aside even though he had longed for a son for so many years, to be able to put that child on that altar and trust the Lord. How often does God ask us to do things for him that just don't make any sense? They defy logic. We share them with our friends and they're like, man, are you crazy? But he asks us to trust him and simply obey and leave the rest to him. Don't try to work it out for yourself. That's when we get in trouble. That's when, that's when I get in trouble. That's when I want to help him. But he asks us to trust him and simply obey and leave the rest to him. So Isaac is up on top of this pile of wood, bound up. And there's no mention of him struggling or crying out. He is fully 
submitted to his father. Another parallel. And now Abraham, this guy who had stumbled so badly through some of these chapters that we've been studying, Abraham is a pillar of faith now. God had been patient with him while he had been learning about God and learning about his own weaknesses. That's an important part of the journey. As we go through similar trials and temptations, we learn about God and his grace and his steadfast promise and his patience. And we also learn about ourselves, where we are weak and where we, how much we need the Lord. And now he has come to a huge trial and Abraham's heart is now in a right place, in a place in which God can test him like this and Abraham can trust with everything that he has. God often takes the will for the deed with his people. When he finds them truly willing to make the sacrifice he demands, he often does not require it. Abraham was willing to make this sacrifice. This is how we can be martyrs without ever dying for Jesus. We can be martyrs without ever dying for Jesus because we live the life of a martyr right now. We're a living sacrifice. Often there are believers who wonder how they may know the will of God. How do I know what the will of God is? Many believe that 90% of knowing the will of God consists in the willingness to do it before it is known. Whatever he asks me to do, I'm willing to do it because I can trust him. Abraham didn't know how God was going to work this whole thing out, did he? When God asked him to do this very thing, Abraham doesn't have a clue how this thing's going to turn out. This is crazy, but I'm going to trust him. Because he had just learned that God always works it out. Not always the way we like, the way we would have done it, thankfully, but he works out everything according to his will, according to his purpose. Because he's got that eternal perspective. And remember what Abram had said to those two young men when he had left them with the donkeys and started heading up to the mountain with his son Isaac. He said they were going to worship. And what do you think Abraham was doing as he reached over and took the knife into his hands? His son was laying up on that pile of wood. I think Abraham was worshiping like he had never worshiped before crying out to God, reminding him of his promises and reminding himself of God's faithfulness. Just picture this moment in your minds. And I just picture God looking down on Abraham and just cheering for him here. Yes, you've got it. Now you see what faith and trust and worship is all about. Now you can see for yourself the work that I have done in you. Verse 11, it says, But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So what does God do here? He provides what theologians would call a substitutionary atonement. God provides a substitute for Isaac 
And he calls out to Abraham and tells him not to lay his hand on the boy. Stop. He lets him know that he has seen that he has not withheld his son, his only son, from him. And right at that moment, at that very moment, Abraham looks on up, lifts up his eyes, and behind him, you can hear this ram caught in the thicket by its horns. It reminds me of chapter 21 last week as Hagar was out in the wilderness with her son, Ishmael, crying out to the Lord. Her son was under a bush to get him out of the heat. She cries out to the Lord and the Lord calls to her. And she lifts up her eyes and what did she see? She sees a well of water that it wasn't there before. She, he provided for Hagar as well. And Abraham takes the ram and offers it up to God instead of his son. And so, after being as good as dead for three days, Isaac is now, in effect, brought back to life by a miraculous work of God. And Abraham, as was his custom, wants to recognize this whole thing by giving this place a name to memorialize what had happened up there. He calls it Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. And it's important to note that Abraham didn't name the place based on what he had experienced. He didn't name it Mount Trial or Mount Agony or Mount Obedience. It wasn't about him. Instead, he named the hill in reference to what God had done. He named it Mount Provision. He named it knowing God would provide the ultimate sacrifice later on for salvation on that hill someday. The Lord will provide. And in verse 14, as Moses is writing these words at the end of verse 14, it says, as it is said to this day, this is now Moses talking in this narrative. Much later now, Moses is writing, it says, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided as Moses is looking forward. Moses meant even in his own day, men looked at that mountain and said, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Verse 15, it says, And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son. I will surely bless you, and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand is that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gates of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. So in further recognition of this huge moment for Abraham, the covenant that God had made with Abraham is confirmed yet again and amplified. Abraham's offspring would surely multiply like the stars of heaven and like the sand that's on the seashore. Couldn't even count them. And his offspring will possess the gates of their enemies. And in his offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Why? Because Abraham had believed and obeyed. He had faith enough to obey. It is good that Abraham now had developed this well of faith. That's a good thing. But it's great that his faith is alive and active. James says in chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works. 
And faith was completed by his works. Read that again. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith, that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed by his works. It's good that Abraham now had developed a great well of faith, but it's great that his faith was alive and active. And so after the conclusion of this amazing scene, Abraham and Isaac come down from Mount Moriah. And the Lord provides and return to the young man after they had indeed worshipped the Lord. And, And what do you think these men had said to them? How would you describe the whole scene? You think these guys probably asked them, so, did you have some good worship up there? How could, how could they accurately describe what had happened? Yeah, we had some worship up there. And so they went back home to Beersheba with the mission God called Abraham to do completed. In verse 20 it says, Now after these things it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Uz, his firstborn. Buzz, his brother. Kemuel, the father of Aram. Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlaf, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Ruma bore Teba, Geham, Tehash, and Maka. So the chapter concludes with news coming to Abraham of offspring being born to his brother. He's got two new nephews now. Two new nephews now. Uz and Buzz. And a name is mentioned here that sets the stage for chapter 24. Anybody's considering names for their kids, you know, someday. Uz and Buzz. But now the name Rebecca is mentioned here for the first time, and spoiler alert, a couple chapters, we're going to learn more about Rebecca. And so what takes place in this chapter is such a clear foreshadowing of what would take place some 2,000 years later on this very mountain. God would provide the perfect sacrifice at the perfect time, and that sacrifice, who is God in the flesh, Jesus Christ, would be raised from the dead three days later. And you can see the agony that both Abraham and and Isaac went through, and how that was a foreshadowing, foreshadowing of what took place in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus sweat great drops of blood as he worshipped his father, as he worshipped his father with obedience. He worshipped his father with obedience. So how do we apply all of this that we've just read? What things do you think Abraham walked away from this whole experience with? That we could perhaps apply to our own lives. First of all, I think the greatest thing that can happen as we experience the trials that God sends our way is that we grow closer to our Father and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's the first thing that can happen. As we experience these trials, we grow closer to our Father and become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. I think it's also important to understand that there's always an afterword to the tests of life because God never wastes suffering. But he knows the way that I take when he has tested me. I shall come forth as gold, Job said. I also think Abraham received a new approval from God. Abraham had described this whole difficult experience as Worship, in verse 5. Because to him, that's what it was. He obeyed God's will and sought to please God's heart. And God commended him for it. It's worth it to go through trials. If at the end, the Father can say to us, well done. 
and he received back a new son. Isaac and Abraham had been at the altar together. And Isaac was now literally a living sacrifice. God gave Isaac to Abraham, and Abraham gave Isaac back to God. And lastly, God gave Abraham new assurances. He had heard these promises before, hadn't he? Many times. But now they took on, I think, a fresh new meeting after this experience. Charles Spurgeon used to say that the promises of God, the promises of God never shine brighter than in the furnace of affliction. What two men did on a lonely altar would one day bring blessing to the whole world. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this is such an amazing passage to read, Lord. There's so much packed into this that we can only just scratch the surface. We read of an amazing moment of a father and a son. We see how that foreshadows what you went through as you sent sent your son. to take our place on that cross because that's what we deserve. But he became the perfect sacrifice such that we, when we put our faith in him, have the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are wiped away by that sacrifice. And we can now become whole again. We can become renewed and born again. So, Lord, as I pray this morning, I pray if there's anyone here in this room who has not put their faith and trust in you as their God and accepted the work of Jesus Christ on that altar of sacrifice, on that cross, they do so this morning and say, yes, I consent to be loved. I believe that Jesus came and went to the cross for me, for my sins, and I want to make you Lord of my life. I pray that they would do so this morning. And start that journey with you. And trust that they know that they will see you face to face in heaven and live with you forever. Thank you so much for the work that you did in Abraham's life, Lord. And the work that you do in our lives, just the same. The journey that we are all on, Lord, I pray that you give us strength to be obedient. You'd build within us that well of faith that active, living faith, Lord, that we would step out when you call us and patiently wait until you do. So, Lord, bless us and keep us. And let the love, let your love fill us up to overflowing that those who see us may see that light. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If anyone needs prayer, I'll be over here.